Governor Blanchard, good to meet you. Uh, and uh, uh, from the great state of Michigan, I spent a lot of time there with my with my in-laws. Oh, that's where, where are they from? Uh, well, my wife grew up in Dearborn Heights, um, but we spend a lot of time now up at Higgins Lake. Oh yeah, and great. Okay, well, welcome back everyone. It's now time to hear the United States keynote presentation at our conference. To introduce this part of our conference is our U.S. co-chair, Jim Blanchard, former U.S. Congressman from Michigan, former governor of the state of Michigan, and former United States Ambassador to Canada, now a partner in the Washington office of DLA Piper. Jim, over to you. Thank you, Steve, and uh, you know, thank you for your leadership. I am in Michigan now. I'm 14.8 miles from the Windsor City Hall. My uh, nephew is arriving back today from the University of Toronto, where he attends. Uh, and so the connections, you know, that we talk about are very real when you live in Michigan or the Detroit area. Uh, and uh, we're just involved with Canada on almost every issue. Uh, I do want to acknowledge Jim Peterson, my co-chair. We worked together for 28 years in and out of government. And of course, here at Coosley, it's a pleasure to work with Jim. Uh, I do want to also thank uh, and congratulate our honorees, Roy Norton, who just received the Sydney Picker Award. Roy and I have worked together again for many years. <clears throat> Mary Lynn Becker, I think I've known her longer than Roy. She's been fabulous, uh, having served our US-Canada relations uh, admirably for, again, a number of years. And then James Graham, um, fellow executive board member. Thank you for your leadership. Our executive committee, I wanted to acknowledge them, includes Dick Cunningham, who's a partner at Steptoe Johnson in Washington. James Graham, who, as was said, is senior vice president, chief legal officer at Cleveland Cliffs. Rick Newcomb, my partner at DLA Piper, who heads up our uh, international practice and also for many years as a major official in the Treasury Department in Washington. Paul Rosado, who's a chief legal officer and vice president at the Formica Group. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Chris Sands, who currently is, is the executive director of the Woodrow Wilson Center, the director of the Canada Institute. And that is a really important organization that we here at the Canada US Law Institute work with. Uh, Chris is also a professor at Johns Hopkins, but these are really our mainstays for Coosley, so I wanted to mention them. Uh, I also want to thank Peter McKay for his, uh, all, look, all the, all the people who've spoken, I've really learned a lot. I found this a really interesting conference, and I want to thank all of you for your leadership, and Peter for agreeing to be the Canadian uh, uh, keynoter and Joko Martin, Consul General, who I work with closely. I've asked my top Canadian advisors to what I ought to be talking about briefly. And I have him here now, a Sergeant Preston, who happens to grace our family room here in um, suburban Detroit. Anyway, he would want me to say, before I introduce our charge, um, that uh, when I served as ambassador, we, they, the Canadian government takes all the ambassadors over a period of time up to the Arctic region. It was really fascinating. And so I saw, I went to a number of places, the Calouette, Pond Inlet, Resolute, uh, Devon Island, I visited the Franklin Shipwreck. Later, I was able to sit the desk of the Resolute uh, in the Oval Office. So it's been, it was a fa fabulous experience. And as Peter McKay mentioned, the people in the Arctic were also uh, friendly, humble, but confident, kind, really interesting, and very strong. It was fascinating. What was interesting was the land looked like it could have been on Mars, but the water and the colors of the water were absolutely beautiful. I also had a chance to get on the doomsday plane with the Canadian defense minister and fly to NORAD. That was fascinating too. These connections are really incredible. Let me now say this. I, I've learned over the years, working with our State Department, that they send their very best people to all these different postings. But I will tell you, they, they send the top of the line to Canada because 
It's probably our busiest embassy, and we are involved in virtually every issue from trade to alien smuggling to Great Lakes water quality to, to space station to NATO to United. It's just an incredible relationship, energy, automobiles. And so uh, the person I'm going to do, who is our charge A, she is in charge of our embassy in Ottawa and all the various consulates in Canada is Catherine Brucker. And she is one of the best. I mean, she she served all over. I can't believe the diversity, uh, Catherine, of your experiences, whether it's Haiti or Cameroon or Gabon, uh, working with our ambassador in, in uh, Germany, then serving as a consul uh, general in Germany, working in the State Department for a number of times, helping our Secretary of State with the Executive Secretariat. Uh, I'm just amazed. Three college degrees, including a master's in international, <laughs> international management, uh, natural uh, science, and uh, it's just military and natural science. It's been uh, an, a marvelous career. And as you know, because we don't have an ambassador in Ottawa, you're the person, even if we did, you're the person that ambassador would rely on. Because I can tell you, when I was ambassador, I relied on my DCM who would have been just as good of an ambassador as I was, probably better, but he was kind enough never to admit that. <laughs> but it's true. Jim Walsh is just, by the way, I hope he was, hope he's listening. We're still close friends. He, he was the best guy I ever worked with. Uh, and he'd been all over as well. But Catherine, I really admire your career. We are really lucky to have you in Ottawa at this important time. As you know, Joe Biden said to to Justin Trudeau, Canada is our closest friend and our most important ally, notwithstanding all those other really important countries. So I'm glad we've sent our best to Ottawa and I'm delighted to introduce you and welcome you and thank you for being available. Our charge aide d'affaires, Catherine Brucker. Well, thank you very much, um, Ambassador Blanchard for your kind, if perhaps uh, overblown introduction. Um, I've had a wonderful career and am very happy to land in Canada now. I'm also really delighted to be here with all of you today. Je suis ravi d'être ici aujourd'hui. Um, and the Canada US Law Institute is really a great organization. So I look forward to participating today and to working with you all in the future. I'm really honored to be part of this virtual event that focuses on such an integral part of the US Canada relationship, the Arctic. Um, as you noted, Ambassador, the United States and Canada are steadfast friends, partners, and allies. And the Arctic is one of the places in which we really need to be all of those things simultaneously. You know, our cooperation in the region is so important that it figured very probably in a number of the pillars of the roadmap for a renewed US-Canada partnership that the President and Prime Minister Trudeau announced in February. The roadmap is a whole of government effort that creates partnership on climate change, on defense and security, and reaffirms our shared commitment to diversity, equality, and justice. And I would you know, add how fortunate we are to have hosted the president for his first virtual visit and scarcely five weeks into the new administration to have this roadmap, which really um, consists, I mean, it's our marching orders for the next four years. So. Um, we're armed with this valuable document and ready to get to, to work. Um, as part of the roadmap, our countries agreed to launch an expanded U.S.-Canada Arctic dialogue to cover myriad cross-cutting issues related to continental security, economic um, and social development, and Arctic governance. And I have to say that even before the roadmap, the Arctic really was an area where our countries have cooperated um, over the course of many, many years. Um, we work together in close cooperation with other members of the Arctic Council to support and to strengthen the rules-based international order in the region. We work to promote secure and sustainable economic growth that supports local communities, including indigenous communities, which is so important, and that respects principles of good governance and transparency. Now, the State Department's U.S. Coordinator for the Arctic Region, Jim DeHart, is our speaker today, and he is fo focused on moving forward with these goals. He leads and coordinates the State Department's policymaking and diplomatic engagement on Arctic-related issues, 
and serves as the principal advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Secretary of State on Arctic related matters. Coordinator DeHart is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service with 29 years uh, experience as a diplomat and he was appointed as the US coordinator for the Arctic region in July, 2020. He brings significant experience in regional security, civilian military uh, cooperation and international negotiations to his coordinator role. Uh, he's had, uh, as you noted, he's a bit like me. We, uh, we joined at about the same time. So uh, like me, Jim has been all over the world. He served in uh, Kabul. He was part of a, a provincial reconstruction team. He was uh, deputy chief of mission in Oslo, Norway with substantial periods there as charge d'affaires. And that may have, where he, uh, may have been where he first got his exposure um, to the Arctic and the important Arctic issues. And um, he's also worked in our Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement um, Affairs overseeing programs in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, he was a Rusk fellow at Georgetown where he taught a graduate level course on NATO enlargement um, and wrote for publication. A hallmark of coordinator DeHart's career has been close collaboration with US allies and partners to advance our shared interests and values. And that's something I'm sure has served him, will serve him well as he focuses on the Arctic. Um, as Secretary Blinken said during his virtual visit to Canada in February, the Arctic really is a unique and important place where we have a responsibility to work closely together to address a lot of shared challenges, but also, I think, shared opportunities. So with that, I'd like to welcome Coordinator DeHart to this virtual stage to talk more about some of those challenges and opportunities. Jim, over to you. Catherine, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, uh, we really appreciate all the work that you and your team across Mission Canada do uh, to strengthen this, this great bilateral relationship that we have between the United States and Canada. Uh, Ambassador Blanchard, um, very good to meet you. And uh, to, uh, to everybody at the uh, Canada United States Law Institute, uh, really appreciate uh, the invitation uh, today and the chance to talk about our Ar Arctic policy and our diplomacy. Uh, so, you know, it's it's sort of um, traditional at events like these to to start with um, some sort of a joke, and um, and certainly in the United States we have plenty of lawyer jokes. I don't know if it's the same in Canada. Um, you know, however, I've, I've found in this virtual environment, jokes just disappeared into cyberspace. So, so we'll skip that and, and Catherine's probably breathing a sigh of relief um, that I will. Uh, so let me, let me just jump into the, into the topic. Um, and it's, and uh, as Ambassador Blanchard said, it's a fascinating one, really. It's, a, it's, a, it's first of all, a great time to work in the US government. Uh, and to do diplomacy, and it's a fascinating time to work on the Arctic. Uh, it's a it it's really a incredibly interesting region, and uh, the people that are involved in the work um, are are really um, very committed to it. I think an interesting set of people. Um, but let me look back for just one second. So I've been in this business for about 29 years, as Catherine said, and normally. Uh, Foreign Service officers, diplomats were were generally um, involved in the business of positive change or trying to be. Whether we're negotiating an agreement with some other country uh, to um, to advance our cooperation in in some sphere, or working to to solve a longstanding conflict, or to reduce corruption in a country, uh, or to provide development assistance to help that economy develop. I mean, we're in the business of change and we're normally change agents. And I think this comes quite naturally to us as Americans. In the Arctic, uh, there is some positive change that we want to see. We certainly want to see more sustainable economic development that's of benefit to communities across the entire Arctic region. There is more infrastructure to be developed uh, there is um, more communications to be strengthened, uh, greater bandwidth to connect different uh, communities. 
and a, a lot of work to be done to improve people's livelihoods, give them the opportunity for a better future. Uh, and uh, in many communities also steps to, uh, to, to address some of the severe social and health um, issues uh, that people face. But in the Arctic, there's also quite a lot to preserve and a lot of ways that the status quo is uh, actually quite enviable. Uh, the Arctic is a region at peace where there are no active conflicts. And of course, the United States and Canada have a very strong interest in uh, keeping it that way and, and making sure that there are no new threats that are arising anywhere in the region that could be a threat to our uh, respective homelands. Um, so preserving the peace. There is of course a great deal, deal that we need to preserve in terms of the uh, environment and, and Arctic ecosystems, uh, wildlife, uh, the, the natural environment. And there's a tremendous amount that we need to preserve in terms of the cooperation that we do in the region. We have very strong cooperation on safety and emergency preparedness and pollution response. And I'll talk more about that in a, in a little bit. And I think, you know, when it comes to international science research cooperation, uh, the Arctic is pretty close to a gold standard, uh, the level of cooperation that we have. Uh, and, and certainly in the United States, we're very proud of, of what our science agencies bring to that, uh, National Science Foundation, NASA, NOAA, uh, others um, that, are, that are heavily involved. So our, our interests uh, are a mix of some positive change needed and then a status quo in some areas that we're, that we're quite comfortable with. Uh, but that status quo is gonna be challenged. Uh, change is coming to the Arctic and I've, I'm sure that you've heard a lot of that today from, uh, from previous speakers, but the region is warming more than two times faster uh, than um, the, the global average. It's leading to a loss of seasonal sea ice uh, and, um, and it's making possible greater accessibility. And so I think what we will certainly see in the years ahead is more tourism, more cruise ships venturing farther north into areas that have not been reached before. We'll see more energy exploration. We'll see more science activities. Uh, and we may see uh, more activities uh, in the security realm as well. We're gonna see more problems. We're seeing uh, today uh, wildfires uh, across uh, northern Russia um, and Alaska, uh, the effects of thawing permafrost in, in large parts of the Arctic um, that uh, damages infrastructure, has a negative impact on, on people's livelihoods. Uh, and, so, um, and, and so certainly the climate change crisis is seen very visibly in the impacts on the Arctic. Um, and we find ourselves today really at the front end of a pretty dramatic transformation of this region. Uh, but it won't be overnight. Uh, there's, you know, you read a lot these days about a rush for resources um, and, and a sense of urgency. Uh, this is not something that will play out over months or a few years, but it will really play out, I think, over decades. Uh, and it, and it, um, so it requires a long-term effort, uh, but it is a challenge really at the strategic level uh, for, us to, for us to work on. And these dramatic physical and environmental changes resulting from climate change are occurring as we also have uh, some significant tensions uh, in the international realm, geopolitical tensions and competition. Uh, a Russia that is increasingly uh, militarily active in the Arctic region and more generally on a trajectory that, that concerns us a great deal. And then China, which um, also has a different view of the world 
uh, than we do, uh, and is increasingly ambitious globally uh, and interested in being present and involved in the Arctic as well as Antarctica. So, uh, so what are we doing? In March, our new uh, Biden administration issued some interim national security strategic guidance where it laid out its approach uh, to the world. And uh, there were three, I would say big important themes here worth paying attention to. Uh, one is the importance of upholding international law, international rules and institutions that have served us well. Two, we need to revitalize our alliances because we know that we're stronger and more effective when we're working together with our allies. And three, we have to make sure that we're connecting our foreign policy to domestic policy, uh, leveraging our strength at home to be more effective overseas and vice versa. Um, and, and connecting the two and showing benefits to our citizens. So these are three principles that apply to our approach globally. Uh, they are also um, directly relevant to what we're trying to, to do in the Arctic. So the first principle, upholding international rules and, and institutions. Some governments out there would have you believe that the Arctic is sort of a wild north uh, and uh, ungoverned space with resources still up for grabs. And um, China comes to mind. And, and the reason uh, they put forward this narrative is because they're interested in, in uh, obtaining some of those resources there and they're interested in shaping uh, the rules in the Arctic region. But um, really important point, the, the rules exist and there is strong governance uh, in the Arctic already based on notably, I would say the law of the sea, uh, which uh, sets out rules for freedom of navigation, uh, for the management of marine resources, uh, and also uh, has created a process by which uh, the Arctic coastal states um, can determine the extent of their extended continental shelves, um, uh, which has implications for, um, for resources on the seabed uh, for, for the states of the region. So there, there, there is already a very strong legal framework uh, that sets out the rules uh, for the Arctic region. And there are strong institutions, uh, really namely the, the Arctic Council, which is, uh, in our view, the premier multilateral forum in the region. It's the primary forum for cooperation among states in the region uh, on sustainable uh, development, on environmental protection, on uh, emergency preparedness, not on military matters, not on hard security matters, but on um, most everything else that, that contributes to an Arctic that is livable for the people in the region. Um, the, uh, the eight Arctic states uh, are at the forefront together with representatives of indigenous communities across the entire uh, Arctic region and the representatives of the indigenous community sit at the same table with the eight Arctic states. Uh, and then there are also uh, 13 observer states and uh, a couple of dozen additional observer organizations, um, sort of at the, um, the outer table as observers. And there's tremendous work that takes place every day through the Arctic Council, through its working groups, concrete um, projects and cooperation in a variety of areas. Uh, the, um, the, through the Arctic Council, we've negotiated binding agreements on search and rescue that, that uh, provide for a division of labor for coverage in Arctic waters. Uh, we've uh, negotiated a um, binding agreement on uh, pollution and pollution response, uh, and also a binding agreement on science cooperation. And so this work is continuing. Um, and the Arctic Council, along with uh, the legal framework that, that I 
that I discussed um, already really put the Arctic nations at the forefront and they strongly support the interests um, uh, of the Arctic states, uh, including the United States and I would say including Canada. And so job number one really is to, is to make sure that we have adherence to these, um, uh, these rules and norms going forward uh, by Arctic states and by non-Arctic states alike. Second principle I mentioned, um, revitalizing our alliances. So uh, in the Arctic, uh, among the eight Arctic nations are five NATO members, the United States, Canada, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, and also uh, two very close partners to NATO, Sweden and Finland. And then um, one competitor or potential adversary, Russia. And Russia is increasingly active in the Arctic. Uh, it is an Arctic nation, has about roughly half the Arctic population, has a very long coast in the north, and very important uh, Arctic interests. Uh, and what concerns us, though, about Russia's approach is um, some of the military buildup that it is engaged in in different parts of the Arctic, uh, refurbishing old military facilities, uh, creating new ones, and um, also exercising in ways that are that are quite aggressive um, and uh, lead to some possibility of, of mishaps. Um, and and of course we have a we have a difficult relationship with with Russia far beyond uh, the Arctic region. Uh, the solution here really is is a strong deterrence together with our allies, uh, which we do through NATO and also um, the uh, cooperation that we have with Canada through NORAD is critically uh, important. Um, China is also uh, is a risk to the Arctic of a very different nature. China has no meaningful military presence uh, in the region at this time, uh, but it has a very long-term perspective and Beijing is clearly interested in gaining footholds around the Arctic region, uh, which it tries to do through investments in infrastructure, ports, airports, telecommunications, uh, and also through investments in, in minerals and in other uh, resources. Uh, our, our, our analysis is that quite often, you know, an, an interest in, in minerals, um, while they're interested in the resources, they may be more interested in, in the foothold that that provides and the opportunity to, to capture a bit of uh, infrastructure and then to try to build on that um, to be established and to gain uh, influence uh, in the region. Uh, China also has um, a number of science platforms around the region and icebreakers, of course, uh, nominally on science missions, but um, the data that is collected certainly has uh, uh, utility for, um, uh, for military purposes as well um, and could potentially contribute to its um, ability to operate militarily uh, in the future. So. Um, so we have our eyes wide open on on these risks. And by the way, on 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 China, you know, we don't we don't say no to to all uh, Chinese investment. And certainly, we have Chinese investment in the United States. But it is important that we be able to look at Chinese activities through a national security lens um, and bring that thinking to bear um, to ensure that that. Uh, investments in infrastructure or minerals or whatever um, uh, don't reach the point that they um, uh, that they generate a security risk uh, to us. Uh, all of this requires very close coordination with our with our allies, with our partners in the region. Uh, as as Catherine mentioned, and really importantly, um, President Biden, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, confirmed that that. Uh, we'll have an Arctic uh, dialogue going forward uh, to address um, all the issues of the Arctic. Um, and it's a great example of our, of our really close bilateral uh, cooperation. Uh, and, and talking about alliances, I would throw it a little more broadly beyond alliances and, and the importance of just our broader partnerships as well. Um, for example, in tackling the climate crisis. 
uh, where we need to have the, the largest possible coalitions to work together uh, to take the steps that need to be taken. And we're on day two, of course, uh, uh, on a, a climate summit hosted by President Biden with nearly 40 uh, world leaders uh, today, um, continuing discussions from yesterday. And so clearly we're we are all the way back in on um, uh, addressing uh, the climate crisis uh, together with, with uh, the rest of the international community, we hope. Third principle, I mentioned um, connecting our foreign policy to domestic renewal and um, uh, showing benefits to our citizens at home. Uh, there's a lot to protect in the Arctic in terms of natural environment uh, and um, ecosystems and species, uh, but it's also a place that people live. And so uh, we see the need for sustainable development as well. We think, um, and this is really this is really a key challenge. Um, how do we signal and how do we support the Arctic uh, being open to business, the right kind of business, balanced with our interest in environmental protection, and also aligned with our uh, ambitious goals together on climate change. Um, we need the right kinds of investments, uh, the right kinds of business activities, uh, green and clean technologies, um, critical minerals is um, very important in those, um, uh, those supply chains uh, for a future uh, green economy. And we have, a, um, we have a great collaboration with Canada uh, on that, that uh, topic as well. Um, these efforts are important for local Arctic communities and they're also important for national security because if we don't find ways to provide that investment ourselves, then, um, then others um, like, like Beijing will find ways uh, to do it in ways that will not be supportive in the long run of these local communities or our national security interests. Uh, so that's so that's really it. Three three um, basic principles: defending the international rules and the institutions that serve us, revitalizing our alliances and partnerships in the Arctic, and making our foreign policy real and beneficial to our citizens. Uh, so earlier I mentioned the uh, the Arctic Council, uh, premier multilateral forum uh, for the region. About four weeks from now. We will, uh, uh, we will have the Arctic Council Ministerial in Reykjavik, Iceland, May 19 to 20. Secretary Blinken has announced that he will attend and, and we would expect uh, most or all other uh, foreign ministers from Arctic nations to be there. Uh, these ministerials happen uh, every two years. Uh, this is the capstone uh, for Iceland's successful chairmanship of the uh, Arctic Council. Uh, it's the 25th year of the Arctic Council this year, the anniversary. And uh, so I think um, as our secretary goes to Reykjavik, we'll have it in mind to, to reinforce the importance of this institution for the next 25 years of cooperation. I think we'll have a major focus on addressing climate change at the ministerial, uh, including the, uh, the problem of black carbon and methane emissions, which is uh, particularly important to the Arctic. Uh, and um, we will see the handoff from Iceland uh, to, uh, to Russia, uh, which will take over the chairmanship at the end of the ministerial and hold the chairmanship for the next two years. Uh, and um, uh, we will be prepared to cooperate with Russia as, uh, as has been the case uh, for, for many years in the Arctic Council on issues of shared interests within the Arctic Council. And I think, you know, watch this space because Reykjavik will be a key stage uh, for all of us to lay out our vision for the Arctic region. And um, I think it will be the key stage for us to reaffirm that, that uh, uh, cooperation is in all of our best interests. That's what we're going to pursue, uh, that we expect the status quo of peace to continue uh, that it's based on the, the very strong international rules and, and governance frameworks that already exist in the region. Uh, and so, um, so we, can, we can take that forward and, and uh, I think we have a good chance of success. 
So I will I will stop there and um, leaving some time here, I think, for uh, for questions. But thanks very much for listening. I appreciate it. And thanks very much again for the invitation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. That's great. Mr. DeHart, um, thank you for your comments. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, first one is, you've talked about the importance of multilateral agreements and coordination in, address in addressing the pressing issues in the Arctic. Um, are there any areas where that is falling short? And if so, uh, what can be done to improve uh, responses in those areas? Yeah, thank you. I I think we have um, we have a multilateral approach in the Arctic Council that works very well. Um, and in fact, um, the previous administration recognized that as well. I think um, our current administration will really double down on that cooperation. And of course, now we have a, an ambitious climate policy, uh, which is so important uh, for the region. You know. Um, I would say that uh, we don't need to establish new multinational structures in the Arctic because what the frameworks that we have are very strong. I think as we proceed, um, we're going to need to work through those current frameworks to you know, continue to strengthen things. Uh, the International Maritime Organization is, is another body that's relevant to the Arctic. Uh, a polar code was uh, developed a few years back to um, support sustainable um, Arctic shipping, safe Arctic shipping. Uh, there's some more work that has to be done there to extend that polar code to um, more categories of vessels operating in the Arctic. You know, and I think um, we certainly have a lot of work to do in the maritime domain, I think, to, to get more navigation charts um, for reasons of safety. So I would say lots and lots of work to do, um, but generally within the, the multilateral frameworks that are, that are working very well now. Thank you. I've got a couple more here. One is, what are some specific strategies that the US and Canadian federal governments can use to increase uh, consultation and collaboration with indigenous communities. I'm guessing this is within the the binational relationship. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to. I really want to identify um, Catherine and her team. You know, for all the for all the work that they're doing in this area, together with the, the government of Canada, to strengthen those partnerships and, and engagement. Uh, with communities around Canada. It's been challenging, obviously, over the last year with, with COVID, um, but it's something we need to do more of. I think, you know, as we, as you look at the entire Arctic region, um, there's actually, you know, there's different parts of the Arctic quite different. Um, the, the European Arctic and the Nordic countries, very well developed. Uh, living above the Arctic Circle in Norway is not much different from living in the south of Norway, you know, in terms of the services and infrastructure um, provided. Uh, but the North American Arctic, uh, and here I would include Greenland, is, um, is different, uh, vastly more remote, much larger distances, uh, and, um, and a lot of communities with uh, very little infrastructure and, and very few basic services and facing actually a lot of common challenges. So I think there's a lot we can do uh, to connect with indigenous communities and help them connect with each other and especially focused on the North American Arctic. And so we're trying to do that through, through various uh, uh, programs that, that we have. You know, we, when I was uh, in Greenland um, last fall, uh, I met with the chief uh, medical officer there, and he was trying to figure out how to deal with COVID and keep it out of Greenland. And he was consulting with colleagues in Copenhagen, but he was especially consulting with colleagues in Alaska and the Canadian Arctic because they were everybody was facing similar challenges. And these are communities, you know, with that that had the a lot of the same circumstances. So those connections are super important. I think not not just to us. Uh, in, in capitals, but among each other. And so uh, we're working to support that. 
this next question just uh, came to me as you were discussing that. Uh, are there any less lessons to be taken from uh, some of the development models used in Norway, Finland, Sweden, those sorts of countries? Um, yeah, pro probably so. The circumstances are, uh, are, are different and having lived in, in Norway for three years, it's, it's, there are a lot of things there that are difficult to replicate in our very different system. I think, you know, I think the challenge is um, uh, in our systems, the private sector has to take an interest. Um, we're not Beijing, we can't direct uh, investment for strategic reasons. So we have to, you know, we have to find ways to support and, and some of that could be um, support through, um, uh, through financing, uh, whether it's Exim, a uh, bank or um, a development finance corporation in some select cases, um, uh, there are limitations on what we can do there. Uh, you know, it, but the, and then the project of course has to be bankable and it has to be attractive to the, the private sector. Um, we work through our commercial service, of course, to, to assist US companies in, in identifying opportunities. So we have to be active there. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's challenging because it still remains a difficult place, challenging and sometimes expensive place to operate in large parts of, of the Arctic. Uh, so, uh, so the answers aren't easy, something that we're working on and, um, and is going to be really important, I think, to get right in the years ahead. Thank you. Um, new question just coming in. Do you foresee development expansion of U.S. military bases and other uh, defense uh, capabilities in the Arctic? Um, there's a, uh, I think there's a very strong recognition in our system that as the Arctic becomes more accessible, uh, we're going to have to uh, find ways um, to, to be active and present there. Um, we're already very I, I mean, I would say we, we are very active and present already. We've had some uh, recent deployments, um, for example, in, in Norway, uh, just a, a, we just signed a, um, a new um, supplementary defense cooperation agreement with, uh, with the Norwegians that, that um, uh, modernizes arrangements for us to, uh, to have visiting forces there. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think the, uh, our new administration is uh, taking a look at the region. We, we are a global power with global responsibilities. And, uh, and we have to, um, and there are trade-offs uh, in the use of our finite resources. So I would say generally there's an understanding that this is going to take more resources and presence, uh, but we're gonna have to work through, you know, precisely how we affect that um, considering uh, uh, requirements elsewhere in the world. Okay, and I think we have time for one more. Let's see. Um, uh, this question asks, does the lack of U.S. ratification of UNCLOS impact U.S.-Canadian coordination in the Arctic and coordination more broadly? And if so, how? I, I think that, you know, um, I don't know that it has an impact on, on how we work together as allies, the United States and Canada. But uh, you know, going back um, multiple administrations, both re Republican and Democratic in our country, um, there's been the sense that we need to, um, we need to uh, sign on to UNCLOS, uh, that it would be in the United States interest to do so. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that's the view of, you know, virtually our, all Arctic watchers and those who follow these issues that it is in the US interest to do so. Now, um, how you get that done in the U.S. Senate uh, brings up a whole set of considerations that are beyond my <laughs> responsibility, and and so um, uh, you know, and, and calculations uh, there. Um, so uh, I would have to leave it to others to sort of determine the, the viability of, of going forward with that. But, but generally speaking, those who work these issues recognize it would be in our interest to do so. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, James, for your outstanding and thought-provoking presentation. 
the United States interests in the Arctic are in good hands. And we greatly appreciate your participation in this conference uh, where there's a lot to learn and a lot to do. Also, I wanna thank Catherine Brucker and Jim Blanchard for the great introductions. So we are going to go back to our panel presentations, but before that, we're going to have another short break uh, this time, I ask everybody to be back at 1.50 p.m. So please return 1.50 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>